Okay, welcome to the second of our series of videos, 2018 updates on financial economics. In this video, we're going to take a look at the context of what is actually happening in the UK at the moment and focus on some of the key risks for the UK, some of the underlying uncertainties as we go through 2018 into 2019. So what are some of these key risks? Well, I've identified potentially six. One is a very high level of, of consumer credit that's unsecured. We'll look at that in a second. There are some big macro risks to growth from perhaps a disorderly Brexit if the UK fails to achieve a, a trade deal ahead of leaving the European Union in March 2019. Some people are thinking there's a potential sharp correction to come to share prices and property valuations. And there's also the fear, or at least the risk, of a degree of capital flight if foreign investors start getting nervous about the British economy. UK banks are quite heavily exposed to the world economy, so if we take a look at some of the risks there. And I suppose one of the other big ones which is still hanging over the banking system are the legacy effects of previous years of bank misconduct, including the billions of pounds set aside for the mis-selling of PPI. So in this uh, session, we're just going to take a look at one or two of these risks and try and think about what, what are the... The, uh, the economic variables underlying them. Crucially, I think this is a chart showing non-financial debt of the private sector in Spain, United States, Japan, China and Thailand in the years before they suffered a financial crisis. So notice here that the build-up of non-financial debt, this is expressed as a percentage of GDP, has happened in a number of countries that subsequently experienced a financial crisis. Um, and people are saying, for example, will the same thing happen to China? The level of non-financial debt is now at a level consistent with what happened in Spain before the subprime crisis 10 years ago, and also Japan before the collapse of the asset price bubble in the early 1990s. So oftentimes, ahead of a crisis, you get a significant build-up of private sector non-financial debt, debt held by households and companies. So, for example, the Chinese credit boom is clear in this in this data now. Put non-financial non -financial debt is more than 200% of Chinese GDP. There's especially a surge in debt amongst local authorities in China. Is this going to end abruptly in another financial crisis? We know that the Chinese banking system has been growing rapidly over the past eight years. In fact, by some estimates, it's now the largest banking system in the world. It's got over $35 trillion worth of assets. It's much bigger than the US banking system, and it's bigger than you know, the euro area banking system put together. Now, British banks are quite heavily exposed to the world economy, and if the Chinese economy goes into a financial crisis, that could make UK banks uh, put them in, in a fragile position. I think one of the big threats at the moment to financial stability in the UK is the very high level of household debt. The total stock of household debt in 2017, the second quarter, was £1.6 trillion. Pounds. <clears throat> the biggest percentage of that is in the form of mortgages. But the Bank of England is concerned about the rapid growth of unsecured credit. That's, that's borrowing which doesn't have an asset used as collateral. Um, in particularly, for example, loans linked to new car finance, people buying new vehicles. <clears throat> Millions of people, many of whom are on low incomes, are thought to be vulnerable to a surge in debt service payments if, for example, the Bank of England raises interest rates from sort of 1% towards 2 or 3%. So although default, rate loans, default rates for consumer loans have fallen, partly because of falling unemployment, um, there is a fear that a rise in interest rates could trigger a household debt problem. One of the related risks for the financial system is what happens to the growth rate in the UK. We're now quite a long way into the economic recovery from the 2008-2010 recession. <clears throat> this chart is calculated from economists' forecast predictions for UK GDP growth two years ahead and it's reported by the Bank of England every three months. So if you follow here the, the, the red line or the purple line, that's the probability based on forecasts of growth in the UK of less than 1%. And the dark blue line is the expected growth rate of the economy. So you can see that post-2016, there's been quite a steep climb 
from around 20% to around 40%, uh, attached to growth of less than 1% in the next two years. <clears throat> now, that's probably a reaction to the Brexit vote of June 2016. People were anticipating this is a negative shock to growth for the UK. The key question, I suppose, is whether the macro forecasters in the city have been too pessimistic in their assessment of the impact of Brexit uncertainty on medium term growth for the UK. But if growth does slow down, that could in theory put the financial system under some threat, in particular the profits of mortgage lenders. Share prices have soared in recent times, fueled no doubt by nearly a decade of, of very cheap money and big inflows of portfolio investment from overseas investors. The FTSE 100 All Share Index has, has surged. Standard & Poor's 500 has done the same. Are we getting to the point where share prices peak and start to fall? We've had a couple of mini corrections in recent weeks. But is, is the bull market in shares about to come to an end? How would that affect the financial sector? Another risk, I suppose, linked to debt <clears throat> is that the level of saving by households measured as a percentage of their disposable income, has been falling quite sharply in recent times. Have a look at this chart, which shows the UK household savings ratio. This is basically the amount of money that people have left to save after they've paid their taxes and after welfare benefits. And it's basically a measure of savings as a share of disposable income. Well, see what's happened. It's fallen very sharply in the last year or so, from around 6% down to around 2%. Now, some economists argue that this is a this is a threat to the financial system. People are not saving enough for when times get times get tough in the years to come. <clears throat> Savings act as a kind of buffer, a resilience to the economy. People need savings. They need to have some savings to call on if they have a personal or a wider economic shock. Of course, savings are a key source of retirement income for families from pension funds. Interestingly, if you take the latest data from Aviva, the insurance company, that low-income families in Britain had just 95% of savings and investments, excluding pensions, in 2016. That is a staggeringly low figure. High-income families have more than £60,000 in savings and investment outside of the pensions. So millions of families are literally living hand-to-mouth, week-to-week, month-to-month, with very low savings indeed. Indeed, a recent study by the Royal Society of Arts found that seven workers in ten are chronically broke. They call this the, the new normal. People essentially just trying to get through to the end of the month and the next paycheck. And the Bank of England is warning that as interest rates go up, there could be many millions of people who have taken out loans, for example, in a car, who will struggle to pay the extra interest if interest rates start to nudge up. So I think this is quite a big risk for the UK economy. And there's another risk, and this is something you know, we're trying to think about synoptic economics here, trying to bring in some other parts of the available course. The other big risk for the UK is the fact that as a nation, as a country, as an economy, we are running, and have done for many years, a sizeable current account deficit. Balance of trade and goods and services, transfers and net investment income. Can you see the chart here? Last year, the British economy ran a current account deficit of 4.5% of GDP, better than the year before, which is nearly 6% of GDP, but still a very significant current account deficit. Now, if a country is running an external deficit on the current account of the balance of payments, you fund it, you finance it, by attracting capital inflows from abroad. So the UK is running a current account deficit, therefore the Britain requires an inflow of investment from overseas. It could be foreign direct investment, it could be portfolio flows into the stock market, it could be foreign people buying London property, it could be banking flows, but we need inflows of investment to provide the external financing for the current account. Essentially, we have to finance our deficit by injecting capital from overseas. Now, recently, the UK has been a favoured venue for foreign investment. We haven't had many problems in funding, in covering the financial, uh, on the financial account, covering a current account deficit. However, there's no guarantee that this will continue. There is the risk of something called capital flight. 
Now, you may have come across capital flight in the context of developing countries. Capital flight can also happen to advanced, rich, industrialised nations. So, for example, here's a quick flow idea that overseas investors may become nervous about the UK economy. Perhaps they fear a disorderly Brexit, for example. Then we see an outflow of funds, people taking the money out of the UK stock market, for example, or taking money out of the property market. The outflow of funds causes a depreciation of sterling because people are selling their pounds on the market. The fall in the currency, if the pound falls against the dollar, against the euro, leads to an increase in inflationary pressure because imports are more expensive. The fall in the pound therefore triggers higher inflation and therefore the Bank of England starts to raise interest rates. But the higher inflation reduces people's real incomes even further and squeezes domestic demand. And crucially, if interest rates start going up, it then becomes more expensive for the UK government to borrow to meet its own spending because the yield on bonds will go up as well. So falling real incomes and higher interest rates, in part prompted by capital flight, causes a slower growth of demand and therefore that increases the risks for commercial banks. So capital flight, I think, is a, is a risk for the UK economy, not perhaps the one of the tail end risks that we talked about in the previous video, but it's certainly there in 2018. OK, so this has been a quick look at risks to UK financial stability with a particular focus on where we are now in 2018. We're going to take a look at um, Minsky theory of financial instability and current examples of UK financial regulation in the videos to come as part of this little cluster of, of videos for you.